Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Tuesday, June 4th, and we are here trying to help you make better financial decisions. We do that by making you do a little bit of work. What do you have to do? It's so easy. You just go to jillonmoney.com. You click the Contact Us button, and a form will pop up. When that form appears, you complete it. That's your email to us. If you want to come on the program, all you need to do is check the box. Mark does everything else because he's so fabulous. While you are on the website, you can check out all of our content that lives there. And you should also check out our YouTube show. It's called Jill on Money Powered by the Compound. And just a note about my friends over at the Compound. They've got a lot of great resources on that YouTube channel, especially for people who really know that you you want to do most of your sort of hardcore investing with index funds or index exchange traded funds, but you got a little investing itch and you like it. This is a great way for you to learn more about how people think about purchasing individual stocks and also just generally getting involved with folks who are following various parts of the economy. It's a little bit more of a deeper dive into investing and the economy and um, and asset selection than we get into on this show. That's all over at The Compound. And again, just click the little link to our YouTube show and you'll see all the Compound content over there. Okay, let's do some emails. Let's go. This is a question from Regina who writes, Hello, Jill. My husband and I are interested in setting up either a revocable or irrevocable trust. Okay, since we really don't know much about this subject, I'm wondering if you could suggest any reading material that would help us gain some information on the correct way to go about setting up a trust. We would appreciate any information you could provide. Thanks, Regina. Okay, Regina, take a deep breath. Okay, revocable is a changeable trust irrevocable is not changeable. Meaning once you create a document where you have an irrevocable trust and you fund that trust, you can't do anything else about it. It's done. And um, you can read up on the, the subject simply by, you know, kind of going online and reading about, you know, what is the difference between irrevocable and irrevocable trust? But really the best thing that I can suggest to you is to talk to an estate attorney who can help you decide whether or not you need a revocable or irrevocable trust. You know, revocable trust can be used to do lots of different things. It can be a way to pass assets more easily upon your death. It can be a way to maybe make sure that you any asset that you have inside of a trust avoids probate. It can also help you maybe treat your kids slightly differently inside of a trust document. It's a much easier thing to do. It's not that hard. It's just a question of whether you really need it or not. And an irrevocable trust is usually, you know, it's usually when you want the money that is or the assets that are placed inside of the trust to be outside of your estate, often used a lot for estate taxes, planning, maybe if you have a special needs child, all these reasons would prompt one to think about an irrevocable trust. So I say you can search for it or you can just talk to an attorney, which is also very easy to do. Okay. Jordan says, oh my gosh, they, they were one of these folks who had a hailstorm in their area. Oh my God. Damaged the roof of their home and also their business and one of their cars. And Jordan says, I'm still working with insurance to get the totals figured out, but estimate that we are looking at oh yeah, yeah, 30 to $50,000 in repairs out of pocket. <gasps> mm. Both roofs were older and on an actual cash value insurance schedule. That stinks. Okay, so they've got 30 grand in their emergency fund. And my wife has some available business savings for the business roof. I was considering using some brokerage fund money instead of depleting all of our emergency cash. Okay, we're in our 30s. We max out our Roth IRAs. 10% contribution on my income, which is $140,000, goes to my 401k. We then um, invest another $400 a month to the brokerage account. Was money we were prepaying on our mortgage. Oh, thank God they stopped doing that. They've got $110,000 in brokerage, $100 in Roths, $145 in traditional IRAs and 401k. They take home around uh, almost $11,000 a month, and they spend close to that. He says, I budget every dollar. Okay. So basically, 
they spend all that money because they are actually really working hard to save money, right? So if you take out savings and pre-planned expenses, they're really seven grand. Okay, I'm considering taking money out of the brokerage to not deplete the emergency fund as the stock market's been going up for quite a while. I'm not grabbing money out while it's down. Is this a dumb plan? Hey, wait a minute, Jordan, it's the opposite of this. The stock market's been going up. So force yourself to take some money off the table. Maybe instead of, you know, like if it were going down, I'd say, oh, that would feel hard to do. But because you have gains, number one, don't be thinking like, oh, I'm just going to just sit on my gains forever. I would actually really consider looking at this brokerage account, the $110,000, and being a little bit more skeptical about what will happen in the future. I believe that you are investing a lot, you're saving a lot, why not take some of the money off the table? And especially if you have any losers in that account and you want to lighten up on your winners, if you've got a couple of positions that have been killing it, take some money off the table. And don't forget to take out enough to actually pay the tax that would be due. I would be tending to do that and maybe some combination, right? Instead of um, depleting all of your cash, maybe you you pull out... mm, 25, maybe pull out 25 or 30 grand from the um, investment account and the rest you use your cash and then you rebuild your emergency fund. Instead of putting $400 a month into your brokerage, put it into the emergency fund. So let us know if you have more questions. Okay, this is from, I feel like, this is funny. I feel like I am about to, I'm going to say this is from Anonymous. I would never mention your name because the subject is how to put 125 grand into a bank without raising any red flags. (laughs) <laughs> Hi, Jill. I love, love you and Mark, and thank you for all you do for us. I've got so many questions, but let me just ask this one. In the future, I'll contact you again. My husband and I have been saving over the years to purchase a Class A RV at a cost of $135,000. Now we do we, now we do realize that this is not at all an investment financially. However, it's To us, it's an investment on life experience. Okay, I like that. We now have this amount, but it's in cash. After thinking about it, I realize it's not the best way to go purchase this RV all in cash. In hindsight, I think it would be best to invest this amount of cash and finance the RV. I don't think that it would be acceptable to walk in with a shoebox of money. I'm just intrigued by this. What do you mean you've got cash? Like cash, cash? It sounds like you have cash like in a box. So how do you get cash into a bank to invest it without raising a red flag to the IRS? It's not money laundering for sure, but it would look like that. (laughs) I I realize that by staggering the deposits, it looks more suspicious than to just deposit the amount, entire amount. To stagger, believe it or not, is a crime. Unbelievable. So what do I do? I want to invest this in uh, money market CDs, Roths. Please help. Um, Okay. So here's the thing, Anonymous. A bank... And any financial institution will flag cash that is more than $10,000, right? So that is part of the Patriot Act. I don't know how, what is the source of this cash? Is this cash you didn't pay any income tax on? In which case, you're going to be stuck. I don't even know if you can do this with just, I mean, if you could actually go into a dealership, into a RV dealership and give them a shoe full, of, a shoe box full of cash. I really don't know. But what I can tell you is that if you don't have the source of the funds that is identifiable or you have not paid tax on those funds, then you have to sit on your cash and use it for spending and use it to somehow pay for this RV. Um, And by the way, I would use your cash. If you could buy an RV for $135,000, that is exactly how I would get rid of the cash. Otherwise, you have to just use it as, you know, you're spending money and figure out other ways to finance it. If you have the cash and someone will accept it, that's exactly what I would do. Kelly writes, subject, thoughts on annuities? My financial advisor is recommending that I take $200,000 of an account uh, worth $375,000 and put it into a five-year fixed annuity and and $100,000 in a index, fixed index annuity, then $75,000 in CDs. I don't know anything about annuities. My thought, any thoughts or suggestions on where I can learn more about the annuities? Let's find out about what Kelly's all about. Kelly's 62 
And oh my God, was widowed since she was 49 years old. She said she'll be uh, taking Social Security sometime this year, uh, which would be about $800 a month, would take to switch to her husband's in 2027. That gives her $3,200 a month. She says, I'll also cash in my husband's pension of $250,000 in 2026. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why? Can we receive that pension as monthly income? That's an, I'm interested in that. Um, I want to know why you would cash in your husband's pension. Maybe we should just get a stream of income. She has $700,000 in life insurance. I don't know how much. House is worth $450,000, no debt, and very low monthly expenses. And she says, I've worked hard to live frugally these 13 years, and I've been in survival mode, hoping to get living happily ever after. God willing, I say that to you. Um, I'm tired of the worries. Okay. Kelly, I want to talk to you, and I don't want you to do anything that this advisor is telling you to do. Um, I am imploring you to get in touch with us and come on the program. I don't think it is a good idea for you to take all of the money that you have, this $375,000, and tie it up in annuities. Annuities are insurance company products for which your broker is going to get paid handsomely, and it could give you a stream of income but maybe we can have your husband's pension to provide that stream of income instead of locking up the money you have in to a product that is very expensive. So your expenses are so low. And of course, once you have your husband's social security in a few years, things will be much easier for you. We would really like to help you out. And I don't, please, please, please do not do anything with these annuities. Please do not. Okay. George writes, an investment firm affiliated with my credit union has piqued my interest for doing a 401k rollover. The The 401k is in a target date fund dated 2040, and I would prefer it to be somewhere else. The firm's site doesn't suggest that they are fiduciary, but they are FINRA SIPC. Good move for me or proceed with caution? Proceed with caution, George. I want to know why we want to do a 401k rollover. If you have a investment option inside of your current plan that might be better than a target date fund, I would be interested. I want to know how much money it is. And just because they are FINRA and SIPC affiliated, that does not mean anything. They have no fiduciary duty to you. And I want to hear how we can help you out. Okay. Uh, This is from Andre. Uh, who writes, I love your informational segments. I was told I can deposit money in a 529 and only hold it for a week and will be able to deduct that deposit amount on my New York state taxes. Is this true? Oh, Mark Talercio, the um, I presume this is the 529 state income tax deduction for New York. And the way it works is that you can receive a New York state income tax deduction of up to five grand as an individual, 10 grand for married couples. And yeah, you know, you, you open a 529 ca- account and you can do that, but the account has to be used for college eventually. And if you don't use it for college and tuition for your, um, for your kids, uh, then you'll end up paying a fee to get the money out as well as the taxes that are due. I'm yes. A little, I'm a little worried that he's trying to scheme the system by holding it for a week taking the deduction and then taking the money out. Doesn't well, work if you way. do that, yeah, you can't take the money out and try to like work around the system. If you need a 529 account for your kid or your grandkid, great. Don't use this as a way to just like, get a deduction because they're going to catch you. See, it's very easy to um, catch you in these schemes and it's not worth doing. Okay. No scheming, guys. I don't like that. All right. If you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Go to jillonmoney.com. Click the contact us button. Let us know if you want to join us on the air live. Don't forget on the website, you can buy my book, The Great Money Reset. It's out in paperback. It's really a great book for people who are thinking about big changes in their lives, maybe even small changes. And we'd love for you to check that out because it's really based on my conversations with all of you. In fact, when you read it, you might say, oh, I remember that podcast. I remember that episode. So check it out, The Great Money Reset And you can subscribe to this program on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite pods. Please leave us a rating and review wherever you listen. Please do something nice for someone else today. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.